Hello, my name is Henrike Hahn. I'm member of the European Parliament for the Greens, IFA, and I'm shadow rapporteur on the European strategy for critical raw materials, the so-called CRMs, and therefore extremely happy to welcome you to our today's expert roundtable with the title Critical Raw Materials Strategy, a Green Perspective. We have excellent speakers with us today and I'm looking forward to an insightful ex exchange. First, I would like to welcome and express my gratitude to the extremely knowledgeable team from the German Research Institute, Öko Institute, Dr. Matthias Buchert, Peter Dolega, Stefanie Degreif, Dr. Johannes Betz and Dr. Winfried Rulach. We will present today their policy brief that I had the pleasure to commission with the title Green Technologies and Critical Raw Materials. And the study's publication comes right in time before we talk on the EU strategy for CRMs in the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, I'm member in. And it inspires, of course, my parliamentary activities on the European strategy for critical raw materials. And I'm very happy um, to welcome as well to the panel, Mr. Peter Handley, head of unit from the European Commission, DG Grow Energy, Intensive Industries and Raw Materials, so a real expert we have here as well, of course. And then um, meet, meet um, Maeve Volger from the Friends of the Earth Europe as my second female speaker in this, in this panel. And then, of course, we, have, we appreciate to have the business perspective with Mr. Chris Heron, the Director for Communications and Public Affairs um, of Euromittel. So we all know that critical raw materials are crucial to Europe's economy and they form a strong industrial base producing a broad range of goods and applications used in everyday life in modern technologies. And critical raw materials are important as well for the European digitalization, the Green Deal, and for the development of future-oriented technologies. Critical raw materials are linked to green technologies that are needed in, for example, solar panels, wind turbines, electric vehicles, and energy efficient lighting but it's highly questionable that we really need them to such a large extent as presented by the European Commission. It will be an interesting challenging, challenge in the future to ensure that the policies we pursue on critical raw materials are green and sustainable and do not damage our planets. And therefore we do need a green perspective on a CRM strategy. These issues were at the core of my reflections as a European politician focusing in his polit polit political work on greening the economy and greening the industry. And that's why I have commissioned this policy brief and host today's expert roundtable. And I want that we provide together green solutions and green pathways without rising the demand for critical raw materials. And I'm really looking forward to discuss that with you. The policy paper we will present today clearly shows that the demand for critical raw materials is only in part triggered by greening the economy. Other sectors such as digitalization, defense and aerospace or the steel industry are large purchasers of critical raw materials and we shall clearly spell, spell out that when we talk about the green transition and the green deal and that's very important. Green technologies that are emerging have very high growth rates resulting in very large factors when we compare future demand with current demand. And as a result, the framing often exaggerates the required volumes. Comparing projected demand and ton tonnages to current production of other materials provides a different perspective and future demand for battery materials only amounts to a fraction of current iron ore production. That's also something we should keep in mind. And as you can see, the policy brief we will talk about in a second will directly challenges the methodology and the selection of the critical raw materials as well as the projections of the demand as defined by the Commission in the GRC forecast study. And this moment, of course, I'm looking in the direction of Mr. Peter Handley, uh, with whom we expect to have a substantial and very interesting debate about that. Let me give you a very rough overview of the conclusion of the study. It was important to me to look at the potential to flatten the demand for critical raw materials. One relevant aspect of flattening the CRM demand that comes directly to our head would be, of course, a change in behavior, but this is not our discussion today. We will have a different angle focusing on technical solutions like substitution, material efficiency, and innovation. 
And we will look at the role of recycling and show the supply potential for key examples and estimations of economic effects. We will investigate how to trigger change towards a more circular economy and more systemic policy shifts to promote reduction of consumption, resource efficiency, and correspondingly saving critical raw materials. I learned from the study once more that we politicians have to work on establishing a well-functioning recycling market when large volumes of end-of-life vehicles, wind turbines, electric engines, etc., are reaching the end of their use phase. And it's clear that we in the EU need to invest in technological information and material efficiency that can contribute to lowering demands of CRMs. We will need the following instruments to foster such a development. First, the EU has to ensure an, in a, an established market for secondary raw materials that is not competing against primary raw materials. Then second, we have to invest in technological development of recycling processes and third, the EU has to improve the design for recyclability in all products containing CRMs with specific recycling rates instead of recycling quotas based on the total weight of an application. And what we can also do on the European level is setting standards via regulation triggering change towards a more circular economy. The battery regulation and the ELV directive are examples for that. And of course, EU policy can stimulate systemic shifts as in the passenger and freight transport for better resource efficiency, for example, saving CRMs, saving CRMs. And last but not least, it's clear that in the short and medium term, recycling won't be able to provide sufficient material to supply emerging applications needed for greening the economy. It means recycling will not be the one and only solution we need. We, know, we need to work on the various levels. And the supply of primary materials will remain crucial. Correspondingly, we will need sustainable mining within the EU and other countries as seen from an environmental and social perspective. In the long term, the circular economy must be the target for the EU policies on the EU level when we work with critical raw materials. And for that, we need ambitious and realistic targets involving all stakeholders. We will also factor in the job potential in the mining and recycling sector. And as you can see, the study worked on an extremely broad and vast topic, but also an extremely important and exciting one. So we will continue now with our excellent experts of the Eco Institute, Dr. Matthias Buchert and Peter Dudega from the Eco Institute, who will dive into the details of our study on critical raw materials, followed by comments by the European Commission perspective, of Mr. Peter Handley, and then we will continue with the NGO perspective with Mrs. Bolger from Friends of Europe, or Friends of the Earth Europe, and then we come to the business perspective with Chris Heron from Euromito. At the end, we will have 20 minutes for the question and answer session, so please, dear participants um, in your office at home, submit your questions in writing in the chat. I will present them to the speakers accordingly, and let's let me make some technical remarks as well. Of course, if you want to have a translation, please please click on the globe or look into the chat for further exp explanation. And there's a Q and A section bottom where you can post your questions, and we will try to answer them, of course. And if you encounter any technical problems, please post them in the chat as well. And please note as well that we will record the webinar; it will be uploaded on YouTube afterwards. So that you can watch it at your ease again afterwards. The expert roundtable will last one and a half hours and I'm sure we will have an exciting exchange how we want to shape the European critical raw material strategy. And now I pass the floor, I'm very happy to do that, to the Eco Institute, to our dear expert, Mr. Bucher and Mr. Dovega. Thank you very much. We are looking forward to your expertise. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just share my presentation or our presentation. So you should be all be able to see my screen now. Is that the case? Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for the introductory words. Um, I think you already outlined a lot of uh, topics that are covered in our study. Um, and before I start with the, with the content, I would like to thank my colleagues who actually contributed uh, huge parts to this policy brief. So thank you, Winfried, Johannes, Stefanie, and Matthias. And um, 
I will go through the slides and um, Matthias, should you have anything to add, just jump in. So I think regarding the background, um, we already heard the introduction. So we were asked to uh, support Henrike in her legislative activities on the European strategy regarding critical raw materials. And in this study, we basically tried to answer the questions whether green technologies are actually the key driver for critical raw materials. We looked also into whether other applications are key drivers and also um, options into flattening the demand. Um, we won't go into every detail of the study. We will rather cover key questions, starting with the first one. So um, do green technologies trigger a huge demand increase in critical raw materials? In this first slide, we can see on the left-hand side, lithium and on the right-hand side, cobalt. Those are projections in the study published by the European Commission last year, which Henrique already mentioned. And we don't want to criticize the study by itself. We think that the, the study is, is an excellent work and recommend it for everyone who's interested in the topic. However, we think that you need some key arguments and some perspective in order to be able to interpret those numbers. So um, looking at lithium, for example, you can see that um, the demand in 2050 might go up uh, in a 60-fold manner. So that sounds quite huge. And you have to be able to interpret this number. At the first uh, glance, this might sound very huge, but um, looking into three main things. So assumptions, uh, the reference uh, of, of the numbers, and the framing, you could actually interpret it in a, in a different way. So regarding the assumptions, um, the projections for lithium actually, or for all of the raw materials in that study, don't refer to just one scenario. There are three different ones. So there is a high demand, a medium, and a low demand scenario. And usually when we talk about topics like this, we refer to the high demand scenario. And it is not certain that this will occur and neither it is certain that a medium or low uh, projection will occur. Therefore, we have to work in scenarios. Also, if we look at the time frame, looking at 2050, we are not sure whether technological uh, changes or market developments might actually lead to a completely different outcome. So what one has to keep in mind is that there are assumptions and it's not certain that this will occur actually. So secondly, the reference. Um, as you can see down there on the left-hand side, um, we see what the growth actually refers to. So this is the baseline. The baseline in the case of lithium refers to six kilotons of demand. And those six kilotons refer to the five-year global average between 2012 and 2016. And from that, the European economic share of 22% is calculated. Um, long story short, this is a very small value. So um, if this value would be higher, the x-fold increase would be very different. So we can only talk about the 60-fold increase because we uh, assume a very low baseline. So assuming uh, 12 kilotons uh, in, in the baseline, you would only see a 30-fold increase in the high demand scenario. And thirdly, the framing. Assuming today's so in this graph, you can see uh, the production of iron ore and a projected production of lithium. Uh, and on the X scale, you can see the volumes in million tons. So if we would assume the current global production of lithium, which is around 85,000 tons, and multiplied it by 45, we would get around 4 million tons of lithium produced. Comparing that to the current extraction of iron ore, of iron ore which amounts to 2,500, we can easily see that uh, it's not that easily comparable since the volumes are much bigger. I acknowledge that, of course, iron ore is not the, the final product. So if you would take steel, um, the column would be only half as big. But I think it's important to put it into perspective. So talking about huge volumes of critical raw materials or lithium or cobalt, you always have to keep in mind that other bulk minerals are extracted to a much larger degree. Okay, um, so the key thing we did in our study is we made an assessment of critical raw materials and their importance for green technologies. 
So in order to be able to um, understand it, we think some definitions are important. So we will first define the critical raw materials very briefly. So on the European level, there is a clear definition of critical raw materials based on a methodology developed by the JRC. And it's basically an economic um, factor. So we are looking at the European industry, what, what kinds of minerals and materials are needed um, and how does the supply situation look? So for instance, lithium has not been on the critical raw materials list until uh, Europe um, became interested and started a cell manufacturing of lithium ion batteries. Um, again, the supply situation is, uh, is a major issue. So for instance, uh, raw materials that are mined in, in a lot of countries or supplied from a lot of countries have a lower criticality while materials only mined uh, in, in a few countries or, in, or where you have one big producer, there you have a high criticality. And all this is corrected by a substituability factor. So um, materials that can be replaced by others are of course less critical than the ones you cannot replace with something else. Then um, one key issue in the whole debate are the green technologies. So talking about greening the economy, you have to define what you mean by that. And I think that there is a narrow line between uh, green technologies, progress, automation, digitization, all those things seem to be cuddled together. And um, therefore we used a, a bit of a different definition in our study. So from, from our point of view in this debate and in our policy brief, we define green technologies as those that include, um, that those that replace traditional technologies without actually introducing completely new functions. So if you think about electric vehicles replacing internal combustion engines, or for example, PV or wind turbines that replace coal fired plants. So you don't have a completely new function, but you replace it with something that is greener. So uh, we looked at the list of the current 30 critical raw materials and try to estimate based on a qualitative assessment, how important um, green technologies are in, in the current times and in the future with regards to the demand for the raw material based on a stoplight system. So uh, we have raw materials that are of low importance for green technologies, some that are medium and others of high importance. And we did the same with other sectors based um, in, in a five-step uh, evaluation from very low to very high. Um, here you can see an example of cobalt and lithium. And of course, they are both very important for green technologies hence the high importance. Um, of course, they are mainly triggered by uh, traction batteries and the sales of EVs, but they have a different outcome when you look at uh, the other applications. So uh, in, the, in the case of cobalt, super alloys, for instance, or catalysts, uh, in our estimation, will play a larger role and compared to the battery demand, the demand from other sectors is still uh, on a medium degree. While looking at lithium, for instance, the glass and ceramic sector is a rather mature market and we do not expect huge growth from there. It is clear that all lithium based, um, lithium ion based technologies will need lithium, while uh, you can replace cobalt in, in the cathode chemistry. So we won't go into further details of certain materials. Um, we will show you the overall results. So you can see that um, from the 30 raw materials we were looking at, six are of high importance for um, greening the technology, greening the economy. Um, so you have cobalt and lithium, of course, or for instance, the rare earths, which are required for permanent magnets. Uh, in the medium category, there are raw materials that are both important for green technologies, but also for other ones. So a good examples are the PGMs or the platinum group metals, which are needed uh, for fuel cells, but also for uh, catalytic converters of internal combustion engines. And a rather large number um, of raw materials, which are half of the 30, so 15, are not really um, of, of a high, um, or they are not the trigger for greening the economy. So for instance, uh, coal has nothing to do with greening the economy or natural rubber uh, is the same. 
So, and one more thing regarding um, different applications and different sectors. So the defense and aerospace sector kind of um, stands out when comparing it to other industries, since you have a very uh, specialized and uh, high need for alloys with specific characteristics. So the JRC, for instance, identified 39 materials required for those applications. And the defense and aerospace sector is also um, triggering a demand for critical raw materials while not having anything to do with green technologies. So next question, how can the demand for critical raw materials be flattened? Um, we looked at um, some specific examples. So basically um, we investigated three possibilities, substitution, material efficiency and innovation. On the substitution side, uh, looking at the traction batteries again, there is a possibility to replace, for instance, cobalt. Um, Current cell chemistries uh, usually use nickel, cobalt, uh, or aluminium, nickel, cobalt, and aluminium, or nickel, cobalt, and manganese. This can be potentially replaced and is already done so by LFP cells, so lithium iron phosphate. However, they um, don't have quite as good a performance, but still you can replace them. Um, this is already discussed for smaller automotive applications. Um, but on, uh, regarding this example, you also have to keep in mind that uh, lithium ion phosphate batteries, since they do not contain any valuable raw materials or not too many valuable raw materials, they are less attractive, less attractive for recycling. The second example are asynchronous electric motors. So those are electric engines that don't need uh, permanent magnets and the permanent magnets are the demand driver for rare earths. But on the other hand, you will need more copper for them. Regarding material efficiency, um, there has been a lot of research going on to reduce uh, the platinum content in fuel cell stacks, which has been done quite successfully. So um, this is a good example to reduce material um, demand for one application. Uh, then innovation is, of course, a very important topic. Solid state batteries, for instance, um, could lead to uh, less material needed for more kilowatt hours produced. However, there again, uh, you might face the issue that the batteries don't get smaller, but remain the same size, and um, you just need uh, a little bit more material. Then larger wind turbines are also um, a good example for innovation where you need less material. So larger wind turbines need less critical materials um, to produce the same amount of megawatt hours, for example. Sorry, next one. So um, regarding flattening the demand, our conclu conclusions are that there are potentials, as we pointed out. However, those are not low hanging fruits. So often uh, the potentials are quite hard to achieve. And as implied, rebound effects are possible. So for instance, the LFP batteries, as I mentioned, are not as attractive for recycling. And you could possibly assume uh, negative aspects um, in that connection. So in general, there is uh, more research development and more incentives are needed for market implementation of those possibilities. The next question uh, is whether recycling of critical materials has a large potential. So first of all, we want to uh, point out that of course, recycling is crucial. Uh, the collection and recycling of every end of life product is a necessity in a circular economy. And it is already the case that for some critical materials, this is happening to a very large degree. So for instance, uh, platinum, group platinum group metals are recycled, <clears throat> are recycled very well. They are collected uh, to a very high degree. So there are already positive examples where critical raw materials um, are almost at a circular stage. Um, growing markets with long lasting products, for instance, the EVs, so electric vehicles, are a bit of a different case. So you cannot expect to cover huge um, share of the demand by recycling since the volumes are just not there to be recycled. Um, this we will see on the next graph. So here you can see a projection of uh, batteries, um, traction batteries placed on the market in the EU from 2020 to 2035. In the dark blue columns and in the light blue columns, you can see 
the batteries that are actually reaching their end of life and can be collected. So in the midterm or short term future, we don't really see huge volumes of batteries being available for recycling. But um, in the future, this will be growing uh, in correspondence with the batteries that are placed on the market. So in the long term, the, um, the possibilities will be much larger. But in the midterm, if you look at the year 2035, if we collected and recycled all of the batteries at a 100% level, we could barely put in around 50% as recycled content into new batteries. So it's a long-term perspective when we talk about recycling of emerging technologies. What are the economic effects? So first of all, um, if, we would if we would recycle more, we could reduce the import dependency of the EU regarding those materials. There are, of course, um, economic effects from recycling with regards to material value. So studies show that in 2030, we could um, recover materials with a value of up to 50, 555 million euros. And this amount will be growing quite fast until 2035, where we could uh, already recover materials in the value of 1.2 billion euros. So this corresponds nicely with the graph I just showed you. Um, the large increases in um, end of life batteries that might be recycled are happening in, in the mid to long term future. A similar development uh, can be seen for uh, job creation. So in 2030, we might have around 2,250 jobs, uh, while in 2035, this could amount to 10,500 jobs in the traction battery recycling sector. Um, jumping to the policy measures. So uh, what policy measures could um, increase recycling of critical raw materials? We looked at um, basically five different aspects. So first of all, recycled content targets are a useful um, possibility. So new products entering the market might uh, need quotas of secondary materials um, to be allowed on the market. This might be uh, interesting because then secondary raw material prices would not have to compete with primary raw material prices, since sometimes the recycling process might be more expensive and therefore you, you create a rare good that does not have to compete with the cheaper product. Uh, material specific recycling rates are of course very important. Um, I will uh, show you some examples later on in the next slides, but basically um, every recycler is interested in getting uh, out the, the materials that are recycled in the easiest way. However, sometimes, as is the case of lithium in traction battery recycling, you have to put in more effort. Nonetheless, you should be recycling certain materials even if they are not as attractive for recycling from, a, from an economic perspective. Then design for recycling is, of course, a crucial issue. So products entering the market um, should already consider that at some point they will have to be recycled. Therefore, components need to be easy to disassemble and materials need to be uh, accessible for recyclers and easy to recycle. Uh, collection rate targets are one thing that can help to increase collection rates. So if you look at the batteries, so portable batteries, um, have a recycling target since it has been established, uh, we can see gradually increasing collection rates. And if you set the right targets, um, this will be very helpful and uh, will increase collection rates, of course. And more broadly speaking, systemic shifts. So um, looking at a shift to more public transport, you will need less materials for, for the transport sector, for instance. Looking at more uh, specific EU regulations, we picked out just two examples, the ELV directive, so the end of life vehicles directive and the WEEE directive, so the waste uh, electronics and electronic equipment directive. Um, in the case of the ELV directive, there is a 95% recovery target. So at the first glance, this is also very high, but 10% of it uh, can be gained through um, energetic recovery leaving 85% for recycling. And as implied, um, for example, um, in, in vehicles, a huge share of the weight is, is steel. So uh, it, it is quite easy to recycle. The rest, 10% is, is glass, the tires, the lead acid battery. 
So actually um, reaching the 85% target isn't that hard without touching critical raw materials. So the non-ferrous metals amount to circa 4% of a vehicle and um, you don't really need to re recover them in order to reach the targets. So here a material specific recycling rate might be useful. In the WEEE directive, a very similar example. So in photovoltaic panels, um, for instance, you have a recovery rate of um, 85%. And uh, critical raw materials, uh, material that is uh, present in some PV panels, indium, uh, would not really have to be touched since it's there in, in, in such a low amount that uh, it's, it's easy to get to, to lose it and still reaching the target. Um, one thing we would like to point out as a step in the right direction is the current EC proposal for a battery regulation. Um, in this proposal, there are recycling um, material specific recycling rates and recycled content targets. So from our perspective, this goes into the right direction. So um, our conclusion. Uh, I think we showed um, in the beginning that high growth rates do not necessarily translate to very large absolute uh, demand increases. Um, you always need the right perspective to interpret the numbers. Um, then I think we showed that critical raw materials are only partly um, triggered. So the, the demand increase in critical raw materials is not only triggered by greening the economy. Other sectors are also important. If we think about the steel industry, where you need a lot of alloying elements or considering, for instance, the defense sector. There are potentials to flatten critical raw material demand through recycling, substitution, material efficiency, and other measures. However, those are not the low hanging fruit and recycling will play only a key role or in terms of volume, it will only play a key role in the mid to long term. So looking from a supply situation, recycling as already implied is, is not um, the main supplier of raw materials, at least not in emerging markets um, such as EVs um, in the short term. Therefore, we will still be needing mining. So mining will remain uh, the main supplier for many materials in the, in the short to midterm. And that's why we want to focus that sustainable mining practices, both from an environmental and social perspective, need to be fostered. And this is regardless whether they take place in the EU or globally on third countries. It needs to be done in a sustainable way, since we will have to mine our materials in this way for another couple of decades. Um, and we showed that current changes in regulation um, need to set the basis for closed cycles in the future. So thinking um, from, a, from the Green Deal perspective and, and a circular economy perspective, uh, today needs to, we need to set the foundation uh, right today in order to make clear investment security for recyclers possible, reduce their financial risks. And most important, we have to ensure that we have sufficient recycling capacities in the future. And we would like to close uh, with a bit of a different perspective. Um, so we were talking about negative impacts all the time uh, with regards to critical raw material demand increase. Uh, the Oeko Institute just recent, recently published a study where we compared um, the development of the German uh, passenger car sector. We compared one scenario where we have a predominantly battery electric vehicle fleet and one that is uh, fueled by internal combustion engines. And what you can definitely say is that, of course, in the battery electric vehicle scenario, you have uh, a higher demand for critical raw materials. However, you simultaneously reduce the fossil fuel um, demand drastically. So critical raw materials can be kept in a circle in a circular economy while fossil fuels are burned. So um, I think this is an important perspective. You, it's, you can see it as an investment. We have to invest uh, in, a, in a stock, which then can be kept in a circular economy while fossil fuels are burnt and, and they are lost for us. So that's it from our side. Um, Matthias, if you want to add something. No, thank you. I think we should give the floor to the audience for questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
You're on mute. Hen. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Um, I think we should collect um, the questions and um, do that uh, at the very end of all the perspectives when we also uh, are looking forward um, to the perspective of uh, Mr. Peter Handley from the European Commission. He's a head of unit um, to the EC DG Grow Energy and Intensive Industries. So I can imagine that um, as we just heard, we all share the perspective of the necessity of the Green Deal, but we do not share the same perspective how we implement uh, the measures. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward um, to your perspective and thank you very much again for this wonderful presentation of the Eco Institute. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and in fact, I think you'd be surprised, uh, Ms. Han, that um, uh, we strongly agree with, with much of this report. It's, um, it's very strong on the role of resource efficiency in the circular economy. Uh, and we also in the European Commission consider this to be uh, crucial for the decades to come. But we also uh, are pleased to see that the, uh, the final conclusion is that um, it's going to take us years to build up sufficient stocks to be able to rely uh, predominantly on the circularity to provide us with the materials that we'll need. And therefore, at least in the short and medium term, we will need primary raw materials. And therefore, the challenge, and we entirely agree with the report, is to make sure that whether we do this in Europe or outside Europe, we do it in the best possible conditions for the climate, for the environment, and for society uh, at, at large. Um, so there's a large degree of uh, agreement with the, the findings of this study. And I think we're really gonna count on uh, uh, the, the Green Party and the European Parliament uh, more generally to help us make what is a very difficult uh, case to the public, which is um, why we may need some mining. Uh, and why we need to do much better in terms of recycling things that are in the economy, because it's not an easy sell politically, but it does make a lot of sense economically, because what we can see at the moment is there is uh, a battle for these resources around the world. Just last Friday, for example, The Economist magazine had a very interesting article which says uh, that raw materials could be the bottleneck to succeeding with the energy transition. And it said there are two main factors for this. The first is compared to oil and gas and coal, the critical raw materials that we need are much more concentrated. And we know that's the case because many of the critical raw materials that we will need for our green and digital transition come from China. And that's not just at the beginning of the value chain, it gets more and more concentrated the further along you go through the processing and intermediate uh, stages. And the second factor the economist pointed out is underinvestment. If we have these, uh, these demand scenarios for the future, it is clear we could face severe shortages in terms of certain raw materials, whether it be lithium or nickel or copper, unless the investment speeds up. And there again, we come into issues of how we can get these things done faster, but with equal respect for the environment or better respect than we have had in the past. And just to show you that it's a real competition, just a couple of days ago, a, there's a brand new copper mine in uh, DRC, which is um, going to be developing 800,000 tonnes of copper concentrate a year when it reach, reaches its peak. And it's all going to China. Right. So we have to make sure that we're a bit more alert and awake as Europe to make sure that we secure the resources we need for our green and digital transition. We put the means and the investment uh, available and that we set the right conditions in terms of environmental, social and governance expectations. Um, I, I agree there can be questions about the, the, the forecast levels of uh, demand for critical raw materials. And for me, the best thing is that you bring all the scientists together, you put them in a room like you do with the IPCC on, 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 on climate change. And you, you just try to reconcile all the numbers. We don't claim our numbers are uh, set in stone, but they give it a direction of travel and they indicate where we need to make a greater effort. Um, what else I wanted to say is I very much agree with the point that there is a big difference between uh, a classic petrol car where there's not so much of an environmental footprint on how you produce the car, 
but there's a massive footprint in all the uh, petrol that you burn during its life. And at the end of the life of the car, all that is lost. You've got some materials that you can recover. Whereas with uh, the electric vehicle approach, you have a heavy environmental footprint at the beginning with the extraction and processing of the raw materials, which we would like to improve drastically in the years to come. But at the end of the life, you've got all these things in the car which can be recycled and you've got value in Europe already in the so-called urban mine. Um, so I think uh, circularity definitely, designing for circularity, absolutely. We're going to look at this in the sustainable products initiative when we re, uh, refresh the whole eco design approach uh, later this year. Um, it's clear that um, critical raw materials are part of our strategic dependencies, as we analyzed just a few weeks ago in the updated industrial strategy. And we're trying to develop strategic partnerships with resource rich countries. Uh, we've just concluded one today, in fact, with Canada. And the keynote of these strategic partnerships is always going to be how we can integrate our value chains to make sure that we can get the materials we need, but we can help the country develop uh, its economy well as well. And that's going to be particularly important when we engage with African countries. Secondly, it's how we can innovate. And thirdly, how we can align our expectations on the environment uh, so, uh, and social and governance standards. So just to say thank you very much. Uh, we're looking forward very much to the discussion going forward and the European Parliament helping to keep this discussion uh, alive. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Peter Handley. That was really precious. And of course, um, um, it's wonderful now to have um, the perspective of Maeve uh, Bolger from Friends of the Earth uh, Europe. And I wonder, of course, after I heard uh, the Commission perspective, um, if there's something like green mining, would you agree on that? Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, thanks for inviting me to speak today and for publishing this um, important paper, which asks some really important questions. Um, I work with Friends of the Earth Europe um, on, the, on resource use and circular economy issues at the EU policy level. Um, yeah, so on the green mining, actually, I'll, I'll post in the chat afterwards. So a couple of weeks ago, some of you might have seen um, with more than 180 communities, organizations and academics, we published a statement on the European Green Deal and raw materials mining. Um, it was written closely with communities in the EU and around the world who are directly impacted by mining and opposing the continued extractivism of this green growth agenda um that's yeah really at the core of the green deal so i think for us green mining is definitely a myth um yeah so some remarks on the study um the insights into what the actual demand for some crms and then it is could be and putting this into perspective against other materials um and what crms are being used for is really interesting and i think it's a a really necessary debate um i know that in public the, the high demand scenarios are are often said whereas um the foresight study by the jrc gives um yeah the medium and, and lower demand are much much lower demand of crms um, and that in absolute terms compared to the example in the report is compared to iron ore um which at current levels is 646 times more than lithium's high demand prediction, predictions. So it's interesting to put it in perspective, but I think whatever way it is looked at, um, especially under these business as usual consumption scenarios, we know we still face um, the fact that a lot of new mining would be necessary under any of these scenarios. And actually, as some of you might have seen the recent report by the International Energy Agency, they said by the 2040s the size of the global market for minerals like lithium and copper will approach that for coal today so if you look at these business as usual scenarios we really yeah we need to turn this around and try to limit the amount of new mining as much as possible um 
yeah, we know mining has an impact on people and the planet. No one wants a new mine to open up in their backyard, whether it's in Europe or in the global south, as we are seeing from the massive resistance to mining worldwide. Um, and also to mention that impacts on the environment really vary for different metals. Um, there was an OECD report that looked at a range of environmental impacts for def different metals. And uh, I think copper and nickel caused the greatest environmental impact per kilo. Um, so yeah, I think that that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and the fact that CRMs, they're not used alone, they're part of infrastructures and products and services that use other materials as well. Uh, so, and usually in much greater quantities, like steel made from iron um, actually makes up most of wind turbines, copper and transmission wires for energy infrastructure, huge amount of concrete in all infrastructures. So, um, yeah, it's not like CRMs are a standalone, they come as part of the whole built environment and they're used in that. So from our NGO perspective, this is all the more reason to look at absolute consumption reduction. So of all materials and energy use moving beyond um, substitution or beyond efficiency, beyond recycling, um, and how we can use this to lessen mining and extractivism as much as possible. Um, we know that the EU material footprint is uh, best research research currently shows that it's around double wh where we need to be for sustainable and just levels and the European Parliament actually voted that the Commission should set a reduction target on material footprint a few months ago a few months ago in the circular economy action plan report so yeah we can't keep going business as usual and just make some some small tweaks um yeah it was interesting in the report even the the kind of trade-offs that come with substitution it leads to problem shifting other materials have other impacts or material efficiency has impacts on recyclability um can cause rebound effect recycling has limits in the short term so we really need to make systemic shifts now um and this is what we try to focus on and push as NGOs that we need to move away from this economic model that's growth based and constantly demanding more production, more consumption, um, which also for in terms of well-being for everyone around the world, it's showing it's shown um, huge levels of consumption aren't actually necessary to meet true well-being. Um, I liked the yeah, there is a good example in the report of looking more at the systemic changes which i think we would welcome more of and need more of um in the transport sector and this is often the example example used that we don't need we don't need to continue the the yeah mindset that everyone needs or should have a, a car to themselves um and that the the raw materials that are going to batteries that we put these towards mass public transport that's accessible for everyone and really reduce the use of private privatized um transport. There was um, actually a, a draft of the Green European Foundation are doing a lot of work on this as well. And um, I saw in a draft report by them that they estimated if one electric car were to replace five fossil fuel cars, the EU would only need half as much lithium and cobalt as is currently projected. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at broader yeah, systemic changes like this. I'm really looking at where CRMs are going. So this was also touched a bit on in the report um, in terms of the, the defense and aerospace sector, which also use a lot of CRMs. Um, from our point of view, the military sector causes untold harms around the world um, to people and the planet and needs to be shrunken and not grown. Um, and for aerospace to really, really need to explore space and use so much material and energy and human ingenuity for this when we're already at the tipping point of destroying our own planet. Um, do we need to digitize everything? Are more robotics necessary for a good life for everyone in planetary boundaries? So I think these are the kind of bigger questions that we need to ask. Um, yeah, and put in place policies then that mean kind of shrinking the ba bad <laughs> sectors of the economy and growing the good sectors, which includes renewables. Um, yeah, and then a, f a final note that I, I know the report didn't go into the social angle so much, but it's very important for NGOs to look at the people being impacted by mining and to give um, 
yeah, to give communities a real right to say no to mining, um, to move beyond the concept of social accept acceptance or so social license to operate and really have a true consent um, of communities uh, for mining. And there's, um, there are some examples. I know there's a, a lithium, potential lithium mine in, in Cornwall that has strong community support and that's an old mining region and it seems to be using uh, pretty properly green techniques so um, it doesn't mean right to say no means that there is going to be communities might say yes if the conditions are right but there needs to be a, an open transparent yeah full information given um, and right to say no so I'll stop there. I can say. Thank you for thank you very much, dear May, for for your um, wonderful insights. Um, and I think it's a um, great supplement as well because you were focusing as well on the consumption behavior, right, and the perspective that we have to um, have here as well in mind, as well as the systemic change. And um, that was um, also mentioned in. Um, the study of uh, the Eco Institute, of course, uh, but also in a, in a scientific way, and you um, were taking a real position here. And uh, what you what what you what you definitely share, I think, um, uh, is the is the perspective of um, um, that we have to um, focus on res resource efficiency as well, right? And I heard. Um, um, a little no real acceptance that we definitely have to accept um, uh, an increasing mining activity, right? That we have a chance to change something. Um, that's really um, interesting, of course, to, to know and to hear. Thank you very much for that. And um, then I would be grateful for the business perspective, of course, from Chris here and for Euro Mitu. Thanks, Enrica, for the invitation and the introduction. Thanks, Matthias and Peter, for the very thorough study. Indeed, I'm representing Eurometo, which is Europe's Metals Association. Our members are representing the full value chain for metals in Europe, so mining, refining, fabrication, and recycling. A number of the critical raw materials on the red list uh, in terms of their link with the green transition, such as lithium and cobalt. Also, base metals such as nickel, aluminium, and copper, where their demand in the future is also tied into this. I'll give a broad perspective covering um, that holistic perspective. When I read through the study, I think clear for me is just the complexity of what we have ahead to address the resource challenge that will come from the shift away from a fossil-based economy, the one which is going to be powered predominantly by metals-based clean energy technologies. Complexity both in the security of supply, which Peter mentioned very strongly, as well as the environmental and social challenges, which is the focus of today's discussion. The thing I want to emphasize is that when I read through, there's not one silver bullet solution to solving the resource challenge, and it's going to require a package of action as we move forwards. We've heard previously a focus particularly on optimizing recycling and reducing consumption models, and I'll cover both in my intervention too, where effective and where there might be limitations, and also pick up on that final conclusion about looking at environmentally and socially responsible primary supply mining, but also the refining stage because we need to get the metals to products as a necessary priority in the short to the medium term. Straight on recycling, I think full support for everything that's been said so far. I think the key priority as Europe has is to maximize the recycling of all of these metals as part of the raw materials agenda. It's been touched upon, but the metals have permanent properties, unlike other materials, which mean that they in effect only need to be mined once. If we have the recycling loops operational, we can keep them in circulation. And that's definitely the long, long term objective to have that fully circular but that takes you know decades to 2050 and beyond i'd also agree with the study and with speakers that europe has a huge missed opportunity for recycling certain critical raw materials to capitalize on in the short term i'd focus specifically on electronics waste and on batteries two fast growing waste streams which are filled with critical raw materials with our electronics waste we know only a third are properly recycled and the study is clear that big improvements are possible. Um, we can design our products better. We can improve our collection and sorting systems. We'd also agree to the effectiveness of material recovery targets, as you see in the batteries regulation, as long as they're linked with the realities of what is recyclable. On top of that, we'd emphasize as Europe, we should take more control over our waste exports. Too much of our electronics is going to develop in countries and recycled in improper conditions. How can we keep that value in the proper way? Uh, and also, we'd like to, to raise the importance of standardization, which hasn't been mentioned. Our electronics waste, uh, mobile phones are complex products. 
they can only really be treated properly by recyclers who've invested into the right infrastructure and technologies to do so. So we think we should set standards so an electronics product can only go to a recycler that proves it meets those standards, both to guarantee recovery of some of these critical raw materials, but also protection of environment and health, which is crucial. There's a lot of opportunity to do more in the short term. As the study also makes clear, there's limitations to what recycling can achieve though, in terms of replacing primary demand uh, over the next decades. The first reason for that, as has been mentioned, is we can only recycle the scrap that's available from the urban mine. A lot of critical raw materials are going into very long lifetime products, thinking of the wind turbines, the buildings, where they'll be locked up for several decades in the applications. Even our electric vehicle batteries are now lasting longer on the market than we first expected. So we're going to have to be patient uh, for when they come back in the meaningful volumes. And that's why the Urquhart Institute, also the IEA have projected these limited contribution of recycling materials. For example, 12% of battery recycling to fulfill demand by 2040. Even for the metals we're used to recycling, for example, aluminium, which is very well recycled, we know that a well-functioning uh, circular economy will only be delivering 50 to 60% of demand by 2050 as long as this demand curve is going up and we continue to need to feed the loop. A second key bottleneck uh, is that we still can't recycle a lot of critical raw materials, either for economic or technical reasons. Actually, a majority of the critical raw materials on that long list have recycling rates of less than 1%, either because they're used in such low volumes in their applications or they're tied up in extremely complex mixtures. So we fully support that this is a major focus of investment and innovation programs moving forwards, through things like the European Raw Materials Alliance when this sort of activity can be mainstream. And you can see there are exciting developments taking place, looking at rare earths as one very strategically relevant example. The UK's University of Birmingham has recently announced a new pilot plant for treating permanent magnets with rare earths for the first time. I saw this week a company in France has received some recovery funds for setting up a similar process. These are some really challenging bottlenecks that we'll need to tackle in the next decade and when we don't have all the answers in terms of our recycling. So to summarize on circular economy, a massive opportunity to do more, but also limitations from scrap availability. And we've got some technical and economic bottlenecks which we, we have to overcome. We've also mentioned a lot of consumption reduction policies uh, and Maeve mentioned this very strongly in her intervention as well. Um, and clearly there are some low hanging fruit where it is possible to reduce per unit the amount of materials we're using. The most obvious being, for example, extending the lifetime of our electronic devices. So we're not replacing our phones every three years building on the good examples of companies like Fairphone and their modular design, that also has an impact on the scrap that's going to be available at the end of life. Substitution also is happening. Uh, the, the, the example of the EV battery is clearly mentioned in terms of what's happening there with cobalt, with nickel, and with all the competition. That will continue to be driven, and it's really hard to predict where it ends up. Some of the other options discussed require a much bigger societal shift in how we're living. The example of moving from a personal way of transport to shared mobility systems is a much more bigger systemic challenge for the future. What I want to emphasize as well is that a large percentage of the metals we're discussing are needed in applications which aren't linked so closely with consumer behavior, namely the basic infrastructure that will be needed for the clean energy transition. So a lot of um, the energy related minerals are going towards an extended power grid, solar panels, wind turbines, storage batteries, and the related digital technologies. It's gonna be very difficult to reduce consumption in these applications without then having a knock-on effect directly, for example, for climate cost. One concrete example here is copper, which isn't a critical raw material, but I noticed that Matisse and Peter highlighted it in the report because it has a link with the energy transition. Over 20% of our copper is used in electronics, so there's a potential potentially there to have a reduction in consumption. 15% is used in cars and transport, which would seem that that's another area to address. The challenge, though, is that an electric car contains seven times more copper than a conventional car. So we'd have to reduce our car fleet by seven times just to break even in terms of what we have on the market today. And the rest of copper's future demand is completely tied up to that basic grid infrastructure. Uh, the IEA says we'll have to double the amount of copper that's going into power lines over the next decades. A wind turbine is containing five tons of copper, not to mention what's needed for making buildings more efficient, uh, for solar panels, for everything else. Together with aluminium, it's one of the most available, affordable and recyclable materials we have for these applications. And it's really hard to see an easy way forwards for having that drastic reduction in use without having a disruption on climate goals. So I'd say as well here, there's low hanging fruits and there's systemic changes. And then there's really big challenges which aren't in any way related to consumer behavior. But I've talked so far about optimizing recycling and addressing consumption um, and 
how they can take the top off the demand curve in the several decades to come. Matisse and Peter were clear as well that in those next decades and beyond, primary supply will continue to have their role. And that means an equal focus on securing environmentally and socially responsible supply of all of these demand minerals in the most balanced way available, as been mentioned. Here again, talking about mining and refining. Um, refining, I know, has been left out of the equation, but that's where China has established its dominance on the global market. The US has targeted that that's where it's going to establish its competitiveness position. Our refiners also need support in staying competitive and completing their climate transitions. But clearly, the focus here is also on the mining side. And, and we've heard that debate ongoing about the perceived greenwashing of a polluting activity, the notion of green mining, and, and the critique that that's getting. I think in the last year, it's become clear for, for everyone that just because our sector is producing the materials needed for the clean energy transition, it doesn't mean it gets a free pass. And ESG considerations will be shaping the development of the industry more than anything else in the years ahead, both in Europe and globally. Also, I could say there's a, we have a concern that in the Brussels debate, the opposite to greenwashing is happening at the same time, where all of these activities have been framed as equally bad or equally polluting in some of the discussions. I want to be clear that that's also a misrepresentation. And like with other sectors, there's a huge range in the environmental performance of mining operations across the globe. Real progress has been made by responsible operators in the last decade to tackle um, their sources of pollution. It's clear that mining will also always have an impact on the local environment, and there are challenges there remaining to keep pushing towards the ambitious zero pollution and climate neutrality goals. But I'd also agree with the study's conclusion that we need to find a way to differentiate the operations which have taken those bigger steps in implementing technologies for controlling emissions to air, water, and soil, to managing their waste and otherwise. Given that these Green Deal demands are unavoidable, we have to make sure the investment is directed to places that have these levels of responsibility. And here I'd stress that companies operating in Europe, as several other developed countries the same, have a strong foundation to build on simply because of the strength of the environmental legislation that we have in place. Over the last decade, it's been really strengthened and the performance has, has, has uh, advanced accordingly. Mining operations must now meet all the emission limits which are set out in their operational permits, related requirements on waste and other points, which is a strong baseline to build on. We also have companies in Europe who are going much beyond their legislative requirements. In the Nordics, mining companies are working to achieve the ambition of a fossil fuel mining operation through electrification of their heavy diesel using mining trucks and processes. Sectors overall are saying a target to positively impact diversity across their activities by 2030 through using a variety of measures related to the mitigation hierarchy. And there's a need to have clear post-closure plans for the long-term life after a mine to, to keep the living value to communities and ensure protection of the environment. So it, it's clear that further action is needed. It's just to make the comment that if we push against all those mining activities happening, there's a risk that we'll divert investment away from that responsible operation, which was concluded in the report, and we'll keep outsourcing the impacts of the Green Deal to much more polluting activities in other countries. So I guess I'd close and encourage the Parliament to try and indeed hold the sector to account as they do with all the other sectors, but to set these standards and deliver the support that will be needed to have these responsible operations continually transitioning towards objectives on an environmental level which will continue to be challenging in the next decades. We'll always remain heavily import dependent, as, as everyone has said, Due diligence will have to play a crucial role in ensuring standards are applied to our global imports, also diversification and partnerships. It will be much easier, I'd suggest, for Europe to drive standards at this side of the value chain if we have a local industry to work with as well. So I'll close my opening remarks there. There's a lot I haven't touched upon. Um, it's been very clear from, from other interventions that the, the big barrier to especially mining operations is the local social acceptance. That's a major challenge for Europe's Green Deal overall. It's not something I have the expertise in, but whatever side of the fence you're sitting on, that, that's a major challenge as we move forward. And we also haven't really discussed the damaging consequences of China's complete dominance of several of these uh, values. But to conclude, I think the Green Deal's challenge, the Green Deal's resource challenge is an undeniably complex one and it's not easily solvable. And we'll need to implement all of these policy approaches together, optimizing recycling, addressing consumption, and finding a way to direct investment to this environmentally responsible primary supply. Uh, and so thanks for bringing a very complex debate to the table. Thank you very much, dear Chris Heron, for, um, for your expertise as well and your opinion. And I would just like to start to pick up some questions we had, we have received here in the chat. So first of all, 
of course, our experts from the ECO Institute. I would like to ask you, um, I would like to pick up a remark of Chris Heron. Um, do you think that your study is on the same place of the fence than, um, uh, for example, the perspective of Chris Heron? And I would like to add additionally uh, a question of Sibylle Riedmüller um, to Peter uh, Dulega or maybe Matthias Buchert, if you like to. What's the underlying assumption in your study that we need to replace all vehicles, including individual transport with EHE vehicles? including the growth scenario, or has this also been calculated under conditions of mainly providing public transport separately, et cetera? I don't know if you, who will, who has. So who feels uh, regarding, like answering that question. Matthias, do you want to answer the second question? I'll try to answer the first one. Okay. So regarding the first one, um, I'm, I'm not sure about Chris Heron's position, so uh, I'm, I'm not completely aware of, of uh, all of his positions, but generally, I think um, most of the things he said um, are, are correct. So the direction which we need to head uh, is a sustainable future and we will need raw materials for that. So basically, I would um, I agree to almost everything he said. Thank you very much. So we, of course, we don't know. I mean, uh, even if we are um, here together in a, in, a, in a nice way, of course, um, we, we do have a different perspective. Maybe should you, we should be a little more courageous to spell it out or to find out uh, in what directions we go, because of course the business perspective uh, is confronted with increasing demand, um, um, price increases um, in all these kind of things they're challenged with. And of course, we from the, from the European Parliament or European Commission, we have different tasks to handle and um, to have also the overall perspective from the Green Deal, which is a different one, of course, as the business expert can have. And also, I think what we, what we share, what we should definitely do is um, um, to focus on um, the criteria that are feasible as soon as possible, right? That we get some speed in all the measures and that we also share what is possible and um, um, from the political side that we set incentives, I think, right? Um, to get um, um, a perspective we share. And to Matthias Buchert, you would like to add something on the second question. Yeah, I guess it was the question about uh, the uh base uh, basement of the data for the scenarios of course in our scenarios and yeah most um, other uh, scenarios in other studies uh, there is um, yeah let's say a replacement factor uh, for instance in the case of uh, uh, substituting um, internal combustion engine cars uh, by uh, electric vehicles I think you um, ask for reducing the number of cars um, by uh, switching to public transport systems. In, in some of our uh, scenarios, of course, this is also a factor, um, but uh, you should keep in mind that also for the uh, for, um, uh, switch to more uh, public transport, you need um, uh, certain uh, raw materials, but as we mentioned in our uh, recent study, of course, there is a potential to reduce the overall demand. Yeah, you can uh, also drive buses with uh, um, traction batteries. Yeah, you need large batteries, but uh, per service unit, you need less uh, raw materials compared to passenger vehicles. But um, we should um, keep in mind that. In a, in a global uh, context, in a, in a growing uh, uh, population on a global scale, we will face challenges with growing uh, and, and growing uh, demand for uh, transport services and maybe cars. But of course, uh, the um, ambitious switch to public transport systems um, can be part of the solution, but it will not be the only uh, solution. Thank you very much. Um, I will just continue with a question um, from Alberto Ruiz to Peter Handley. Um, he's writing that in his opinion, materials won't be extracted to feed the grand trans green transition, but to feed the demand in the markets. And lithium batteries can be perfectly implemented in the last iPhone model and the community-based electricity generator, he writes, 
but the increase of extraction of raw materials doesn't look like to him as a way to speed up the green transition and fight climate change, but to support the industry and its business as usual. So his question is, why is the European community not thinking about implementing CE products restrictions? Well, I respect uh, I respect the uh, the observation, but um, I don't fully fully share the point of view. I think uh, uh, the experts who presented the study today have shown that um, uh, uh, shifting away from a fossil fuel driven economy means, to a certain extent, uh, uh, moving into more um, raw materials intensity. Um, and the, the key challenge is to make sure that we minimize the amount of that intensity as we go forward and do things in the best possible way. But I think it's um, a bit dangerous to put all the kind of criticism on the mining extractive part of the value chain, because if we block, if we block everything in that space, uh, it's going to mean that we're losing jobs and growth in Europe um, we're not going to be able to switch to the clean technologies that will be needed, but other parts of the world will accelerate into doing precisely those things. And we'll, we'll be finding that the consumers in Europe are just buying the products made in other parts of the world in a less environmentally and socially responsible way than, than we choose to be. And I think the approach that we've shown on the batteries regulation is indicative of how we see that European regulation can try to make sure that you have... Uh, transparent supply chains for the raw materials, high environmental standards in the product, um, really ambitious recycling targets and pushing um, minimal recycled content in future products. I think it's a, a good indication of, of the kind of policies that we, we need to support the green and digital transition. Thanks for your perspective. Um, when you are mentioning um, that we need more uh, intensity, I wonder, of course, like with the study we are publishing today um, showed, of course, as um, Peter Duliga was um, uh, showing that we don't, uh, that um, actually we, we need, we, uh, that we need, that we do not need more raw materials, right? It showed that we need more these usage, circular economy, and all these kind of things. And uh, of course, I would wonder, um, uh, what kind of arguments uh, you have as well um, used, that you used a, a different methodology than uh, was, was, uh, that it was spelled out in the study, right? Um, other figures are the, uh, a different methodology that leads to a path that um, is referring to uh, different figures as a, as a base for um, a strategy, a green strategy that doesn't lead, goes uh, necessarily in the wrong, in the right direction, right? So I wonder uh, what your answers to that criticism? Well, as I pointed out, the study answers the question, what raw materials are needed for green technologies? Whereas the commission's criticality assessment is what raw materials are needed for the European economy? It's a broader question. Um, and uh, the, the methodology that we use is one that's based on facts. So we take the average of, of, of the last uh, available five years to give us a fact-based approach to developing our understanding of the needs. And we, we also take account of environmental and social uh, and governance factors because we use the World Bank's World Governance um, Index as the way to match, uh, to, to, to integrate that into our assessment. So you've heard we, we integrate the, uh, the uh, scope for uh, uh, substitution. We also look in at the environmental and social uh, dimension when we do assessments. I think most of the comments made by the experts today were about the forecasting, which is the foresight report we did, where I've said, let's, let's put all the experts in the room, whether they're from the IEA, the World Bank, uh, Systemic uh, Material Economics, UCO, and I'm sure that they would have a range of um, expert opinions on these things, but I think they could also rally around certain assumptions, such as... Uh, which, which raw materials are likely to be in the greatest demand and where there's likely to be the greatest uh, stress in terms of environmental uh, and uh, geopolitical access. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I wonder, of course, why in the EC methodology, um, the environmental and social, social, societal challenges related to raw materials are not considered in an adequate way. 
uh, when the commission established the list of the critical raw materials. And I wonder, of course, Maeve, if, if that could be your perspective too here. Um, yeah, yeah, how, how they're decided on is um, of economic importance to the, the current EU economy and um, of high supply risk. So yeah, yeah, we'd agree to bring in broader environmental and social aspects to have a, a list that's more reflective of, mm -hmm. of those as well. One thing um, which is clear from the analysis from the ECO Institute is that there are a number of, of metals and minerals in particular that have a link with the green, en green energy transition. And it's not the whole list of critical raw materials but you see in the IE International Energy Agency and the World Bank that the sort of consensus around lithium, cobalt, rare earths, as mentioned, aluminium, copper, nickel, and some of the base metals too, as, as particular focuses moving forwards. Um, and we might, people might disagree on the levels of, of what shifts, and there's a huge amount of uncertainty there, but the trend seems clear according to current technologies, and I think creates challenges and problems to be assessed without easy answers now. So I don't know not really answering any question, but there's this smaller group of metals and minerals which, which have that link, which perhaps require that continued attention. Thank you. Um, just let me add um, an additional question uh, on that. I mean, could you, uh, dear um, Chris uh, Heron, um, could you maybe tell us how advanced the debate is on the substitution of one raw materials among your stake? Holders. So how is the business community preparing in practical terms for that? What are the biggest challenges, the biggest problems, or how do you prepare as well for the increased role of recycling? We also uh, um, work on, on the, at the European poli 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 political level. On recycling, one thing to mention, most metals companies in Europe have activities across different stages of the value chain. So the sole mining companies also have the, the biggest Swedish mining company is also the Europe's biggest electronics waste recycler. So I think overall the industry is looking at, at these shifts and is uh, advancing its, its participation across the value chain. So the notion of primary supply recycling, it's, it's advancing as these flows develop as well. The question on substitution is, the substitution is happening on the market and it's clear. The best example again is the electric vehicle battery where Con uh, concentrations, for example, of nickel are increasing while consumption uh, concentrations of cobalt are decreasing for various reasons related to cost, <laughs> instability, and others. I think um, for an association representing all metals equally, that can pose challenges, but it's clear that um, companies are, are taking that on board and reacting. And companies typically have a portfolio of metals they're using, and there's interlinkage as well. The cost of cobalt in a recycling stream never can come together. So it's hard to explain how yeah, interlinked and connected it can be, but it does make these discussions. Thank you very much. And I hope you all were able to hear uh, because the sound was a little lost for me at the very uh, end, but um, I think the most of the part I was able to hear. Thank you very much. Um, just as a last question we have, because the time is passing so quickly, um, again, so Maeve, um, like when you hear all these arguments and we were listening to your arguments before, do you have um, um, do you have the perspective that um, the European, European politics means the European Parliament and the Commission, but also the businesses are really listening to the arguments you were lying out before when, you, when, we, when we talk about critical raw materials? Is there something, do you have some um, suggestion as well uh, how uh, these perspectives can get stronger in future? What has been done by politics to involve that a little better than ever before? Yeah, I think I've been working in Friends of the Earth Europe for six years and I think it is slowly <laughs> mindsets are changing and even with the European Green Deal as the priority for um, the current commission even if we don't agree with a lot of what's in it it is a step forward but things need to move much faster and I think stricter more binding measures need to be in place and this whole thinking that European mining in the EU or mining by European companies is um is fine and it's sustainable and green is um 
not really true. There's the Responsible Mining Index that looks at the performances of metal and mineral mining companies found that none of the companies um, met the expectations of societal expectations in any of the areas um, anywhere in the world. So yeah, there's there's a lot, a lot to be done. And for example, mining is still allowed in Natura 2000 areas. Um, and and other uh yeah near unesco heritage sites and so on um communities don't have a real right to say no to mining um the legislation around circular economy is quite um a lot based around voluntary initiatives rather than really strict legislation like banning planned obsolescence or um yeah more strict binding measures because we've seen what's what's going on so far isn't actually leading to big enough change that we need. So I think, yeah, there definitely needs to be more um, a push away from our current system. Thank you very much. Um, let me let me um, invite you to a last round and with a very short question to each of you. Um, if you would have the chance to change something now immediately uh, up to one, two or three measures you could realize or implement um, handling the current critical uh, raw materials situation, what would it be, dear Peter Kollega? Um, I would start with material recycling rates, material specific recycling rates. So for instance, if we talk about uh, lithium ion batteries, materials that are not easy to recycle or not as attractive from an economic stand standpoint would have to be recycled. So lithium would be a good point. And uh, recycled content from my perspective is, is a good approach since uh, as I already pointed out in the presentation, uh, you, cre you create a rare good basically and you have a market that does not have to compete with primary raw material prices. So those two aspects, which are already addressed in in, um, in the EU proposal for the better, those things can be implemented uh, for other regulation, as pointed out, the EOV directive or the WEEE directive. And I think there are huge potentials. So um, yeah, from a policy perspective, I think this is implementable. It has to be realistic. So it doesn't make sense to demand 100% recycling quota for certain materials. That's certainly not, not uh, sensible. But in general, I think it's the step uh, in the right direction. And it makes sense to... Um, start with lower targets and increase it in the future to um, make it operationalized, to, to, to can, so that comp companies can operationalize it. Thank you very much. And what would be you, your measures, dear Matthias Buchert, if you could implement something immediately? Yeah, um, in, in my opinion, uh, that's, an, uh, that's a totally different issue. Um, uh, we make a lot of problems in urban planning and this results in um, a lot of uh, wasted materials, bulk materials, but also um, critical raw materials because with a more um, a better and innovative urban planning system, we uh, can reduce uh, distances, uh, we can reduce uh, traffic, we can reduce also the number of cars, etc. But this is really a big, big issue, a totally different issue, but it's um, underestimated. So there is there are huge um, uh, potentials to reduce um, raw materials demand, um, CO2 emissions, etc., etc., by a better urban planning system. Thank you very much. So we would rather um, need a systemic change as well, if I was able to understand it in a correct way. And dear Peter Handley, if you could change something immediately tomorrow, what would you do for uh, handling the critical raw material situation? Yeah, well, it, I know it's difficult to start a new uh, greenfield mine um, anywhere in the world, but I think we should be looking at uh, past mining operations, which have left mining waste behind, mining waste and tailings which uh, is full of critical raw materials, whether it's bauxite or iron ore, or even coal, cold, uh, coal tailings. It's full of many of the critical raw materials. These sit in regions which have uh, a proud mining tradition with people who have engineering and mining skills and which in often facing depopulation to the cities. So I would um, encourage uh, 
industry and uh, local communities to be looking at the potential for um, getting a kind of just transition approach towards uh, uh, recovering critical raw materials from past mining activities um, and with a particular focus on coal regions which will need help with their transition out of coal. Thank you very much. So actually the latter aspect you, you were just mentioning is exactly uh, one of the tasks we have on the European level, right? To invite the industry, but also the local stakeholders. I wonder if we really do that in an adequate way, because uh, I experienced that in the parliament. I always have to fight for that uh, when I work on legislative uh, amendments, for example, right? Um, so this is not um, evident, so by the law. Uh, you would say in French, um, yeah. So dear Maeve uh, Bolger, what would you realize and even change um, handling the critical raw material situation, if you could do that? Yeah, policy-wise, I think I would go for a material footprint reduction target. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, we've seen the in climate, we have emissions reductions target, and that's really driven the debate and this, the discussion on how much um, we need to reduce emissions and what then in terms of the policies and the plans and exactly what we need to put in place to to meet them. And I think the same needs to happen in terms of total material footprint. Um, yeah, we need to set a, look into what is a sustainable and just level. There's a few researchers out there, but I think the Commission, like the Parliament said, needs to do their own research on what is a fair share target and then how do we meet this? Um, not, and it would have knock-on effects on our consumption um, across the whole economy. So I'm going to go for that. Thank you very much. And uh, dear Chris Heron, um, do you have the same perspective or do you have differing wishes than May Volker? I'll try and give something different. One thing just to clarify, the responsible mining index was mentioned as a marker of sustainability. Just to mention that covers global mining companies. The European companies I'm talking about, often the best performers I'm talking about aren't included in the assessment. I saw a link was, was shared. I just want to be clear that there are some companies which I'm, I'm talking about which aren't covered. In terms of practical things I think we can do today, I think setting standards for recycling products containing critical raw materials is one. Two, investment innovation across the value chain to um, tackle some of those bottlenecks. And three, more clarity on what we mean by responsible primary supply. It's, it remains a big source of debate across all of us. I guess it would be helpful if we knew what responsibility is. Thanks. Thank you very much for your perspective as well. And um, I think we had a wonderful, very extremely um, interesting uh, discussion today. Um, you all are invited, of course, to read uh, also the participants at home or in the offices to read again the very precious study of the Eco Institute. I will publish it on my homepage, of course, and then um, if you can read it again. And please, all the questions you were asking who didn't have the chance to get picked up, please send it to me by, via email again and you can answer it, of course, uh, because it's, it's very valu valuable what you all think and we, we are happy to answer it. And I think in general, what I take with me today is um, we must do everything possible to make a truly green and sustainable transition to climate neutrality. This is also what I heard from all, the, from all of your perspectives, even if you have a different background. Um, so this can only happen with a green and sustainable raw material strategy, that's for sure. I mean, even if we share some point of views, uh, we have um, a perspective that we um, think that an important, that a differing um, pathway is um, uh, possible and necessary. And I definitely think that a green raw material strategy is possible. It can happen through reduced consumption, more efficient resource use, sustainable products and innovation, as mentioned today in our discussions. And at the same time, we must increase the raw materials efficiency, recycling and substitution. And the future lies in circular economy with long life designed and repairable products ensured by high quality recycling, largely closed material cycles and priority use of recycled raw materials. And we can only meet the climate targets by shifting to a circular economy and the transition needs to happen by 2050 at the latest, but much earlier would be even better. And I think the legal binding targets for material use and consumption, consumption patterns are badly needed. They were the main missing piece of the puzzle in the European Commission's proposal. And if approved by the Commission and member states without delays, the targets can play a central role in Europe's green recovery, helping citizens, businesses and governments save valuable and limited resources. 
So I thank you very much for, um, for your time and uh, all your arguments. Uh, it was a real pleasure to have you and um, I hope we're gonna stay in contact. Please, uh, participants at home and in, in the offices, thank you very much for your participation and I hope to, to be in contact and um, I'm always looking forward to hear from you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.